Let's go. All right, uh, good evening, good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? Is this a football crowd or is this a general? Is this, yeah? All right, thank you so much for coming through. Um, and I think a lot of you, the first time you've actually seen exclusive books. And I think for a lot of you, the first time you've actually seen books. But we've got to thank this man here, the general. Uh, for making sure that all of us uh, go into the Christmas break uh, with something to read. You know, something of a historical nature because not only is it just about a book launch, it's about what have South African football players done to leave behind a legacy that means something. Because everybody plays, they go on, and nobody knows their history. So I think kids that will be born 20 years from now will always be able to reference the great Deco Modise, and that deserves a big round of applause. Uh, just a, a quick note that if you want to make a, any special orders for the book, in other words, if you're going to be buying, let's say, five books to a hundred in one batch, um, then you can go and get this form, which you then fill in so that we can go and deliver uh, everything to you. Give us all your contact details and delivery uh, address, etc. So if you want to buy, I know it's Christmas time, there's a school next to you, wherever you stay and there's 50 books you want to buy. Uh, this is the form that you need to fill in. And before we get started as well, uh, I just want to call upon, there's a young man who was on social media uh, with the Teco Medisa old jersey. And we went on a campaign trying to find him uh, so that we can actually get him to meet his idol who is right here. So thankfully, because you know, Twitter police are, are sharper than seps. Um, they were quite quick in tracking him down. So apparently his name is also Tiko. You know, it's in the ID book. So Tiko, if you come up, please. Uh, he's all the way from Mekatlehong. And uh, they've made sure that we bring him here today. How are you? Uh, I do believe that there's also a jersey that we're supposed to give him. So, anyone that has the jersey, then let's bring it up. Yeah. So, he's already all dressed up for a full 90 minute game. And there he is. A future Modisa. So, please, uh, the two decos, uh, just step forward here for uh, camera crews uh, for an official picture. I think this is a very poignant moment uh, tonight. With the jersey handover, the one retires and the other one takes over. <laughs> so, we're sending subtle hints here. Yeah? Shab Deko. Shab Deko. Huh? Five. Number five. We have time to take one. Why you have time? Oh, some jelly afterwards, ain't it? Eh. 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 Give him a big round of applause, please. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, let's get down and chat about this book. And um, if you are on social media and you want to be tweeting, uh, the hashtag is simply hashtag Curse of Tiko Medise. So leave out the, just say Curse of Tiko Medise. Um, you got your microphone, sir? Right here. Just firstly, thank you so much for what you've done in terms of the book. Is there anybody that you'd like to highlight in the audience, any family that you want to highlight, any special person that you want us to know about who's here today? 
Okay. Um, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, my mom is here. Actually, she's on the far left. She's having a week on, so you can't see her properly. <laughs> yeah, and um, also um, the iconic Joma Son as well is here. And uh, I haven't seen many. And also my friends and other family members are here as well. So I feel very honored to be here, and thanks everybody for coming through. Mom Lisbeth. Mom Lisbeth. Hello, so woman. Who changed your mind? Sick born. Because that's probably where I'm going to start. Um, I did say to Tiko that we could be brutally honest both ways. Uh, there's a light detector test machine that's already on. And ladies and gentlemen, let's also welcome the author of the book, Nikolaus Kikinus, who's here. Nikolaus. I mean, here you are. A well-known journalist you've already sparked a whole lot of media conversations already like why would Deco choose a white dude to do his book <laughs> so I'm not gonna beat about the bush I'm gonna start right there. how and why did this happen yeah so it's um it's, it's quite a funny story actually it was it was a, a bit of chance it happened you know I've, I've always absolutely loved Teko, followed his career with uh, with great interest and uh, one day before work before working as a football journalist, I was watching on the TV, E! News, it comes on. And uh, they say that, uh, you know, the famous Teko Modise is looking to have a book written. And then he comes on TV, he says, yeah, you know, I think it's time. Now it's time for my book to be written. So I went around and I asked everyone in town, I asked everyone I could, until they're uh, generous enough to give me Jazzman's number. And I called Jazzman, I said, hi, Jazzman, I'm a, I'm a journalist from Sokola Duma, and you're ah. Damn it, he wasn't happy at all. Yeah. And then I said, no, no, listen, this is something different. I said, I think, I think I'm the guy that needs to write Teko's book. He's like, okay, we've had lots of other offers. He's like, you need to come up here to Johannesburg and you will convince us. Had the meeting with Jasmine, met Teko, told them my vision for the book. I told them how much I really knew about Teko's career and they were, and they were, they were very happy with it. And um, of course, there was a lot of questions being asked why, why the white guy is writing Teko's book. Uh, but for me, I think it's quite a cool thing. Um, I think in a country like ours where we've got all different kinds of race, colors, everything, I think it's cool if we can get as many different kinds of people together to tell South African stories as possible. And I think that's what we've done here. So I'm really happy with what we've achieved. What is your biggest challenge in terms of dealing with the superstar that he is, dealing with a lot of stories that have been, because in the world of tabloidisms, there's a lot of things that we don't even understand whether we believe about Deco or not. So now here he is, able to tell his own story, written via you. How difficult was that? The working with Teko wasn't difficult at all. He was incredible. He was straight from the start. We sat down on his couch and he got right into it. He told me a story from the beginning and he was frank, he was open, he was honest. He didn't make it uh, look like it was a PR campaign for himself. The most difficult part is actually producing a book because now you must realize there's a lot of different elements at play. Now it's not just me and Teko who want to tell a story. Now it's me, Teko, there's publishers. Now there's agents, now there's newspapers. Now uh, there's people who are scared of getting sued. Um, there's people who think this is inappropriate, you know. If, uh, if it was just left to me and Teko to tell a story, it, it would be a lot wilder than what it turned out. So working with Teko was the easy part. We got along well, we speak the same language, and we both had a very similar vision. I mean, from the transcript, though, before I come to Deco, have you had any lawsuits as yet? Uh, I haven't checked my mailbox in a while, Robert, but uh, so far, so good. All right, uh, and long may that continue. And, and it's made easier, though, because this book delves into so many different chapters and layers of his life, personal life, growth, family, friends. I know it's a good thing we're drinking water here because there was parts where, you know, his water was blessed from other sources, you know, the alcohol was right in there in the book. And it's, it's kind of made it easy now, seeing that Teko's mom's here. Uh, also, the legendary Jomasano is here. Oh, and I see Sheikh's Mashawa also here. So let's give both of them a big round of applause. Uh, that it will make the conversation quite easy in dealing with the jersey number 10 because that occupies also a big part of the book as to why he was not given jersey number 10 
at Orlando Pirates. A jersey that has been sacrosanct to that man sitting there called Jomo Sono. So why doesn't Jomo want to release number 10? <laughs> Modise is not your dad's surname. Modise is mom's surname. Why the decision not to go with dad's surname? Um, sure. Okay, yeah, I love it. I think, um, I think at first when I, was, when I was very young, when I was staying with my dad, I was using my dad's surname. And uh, when I moved in to stay with my mom, and um, I didn't know where my dad was, so it was kind of easy for me to use my, my mother's surname because my sisters always use my mom's surname and my brother as well, so it was, it was very easy for me to use my, uh, my mom's surname. I mean, you talk about it flippantly as if it was a choice. It wasn't a choice. It was because your dad chucked you out of the house. Your dad and you didn't get along. Thinking, what was he thinking? He, he, I mean, he, he chucked out a diamond like this. Out of the house. Yeah. What was it, though? Because he didn't want you to play football. That's one thing I know for sure. He didn't want you to play football. He loved football. Yeah, yeah. You went to watch football with him. Yeah. But the fact that you got to play football was no-no. Yeah, I think um, maybe something bad happened with him, maybe when I was playing football, because um, at that age I could hear people from um, Midland saying that he was actually a good football player. So, so I find it very difficult to, to, to learn that he doesn't want me to play football, what else he played football himself. So, and he's the first person actually to take me to the stadium to go watch the game. So he actually introduced me to the game. So it was very, very difficult for me to understand why he doesn't want me to play football, what else he's the one that introduced me to the game. So. I always had to play football behind his back, and um, whenever he sees something that has, has to do with football in the house, I'll get a whipping from that. So actually, I didn't enjoy playing football at the time, because his main focus was for me actually to go to school. We can be honest and say, on more than multiple occasions, he physically abused you. I mean, he, he was not messing around. I know that we're in 16 days of activism, uh, which is the <laughs> irony. Uh, but. You know, those campaigns weren't there back in those days. How do you reflect back on that? And just the fact that at the moment where you got chucked out is when he came back home with all sorts of wounds and denying at Bebem I mean, he was a mysterious guy. Like, nobody knew actually what he was doing and how he was doing it because it was only me and him. And he would come back late at night with blood stains on his, on his shirt and stuff. But, um, I was very too young to actually ask him what's, what's wrong because he's not a guy that we actually have a conversation with. He doesn't joke at all. So whatever they say something is very, very serious. So, so actually, um, when he said to me that I need to be out of the house, when he came back from work, I knew that he was serious. But the problem was I didn't know where to go, actually. So it was, for me, it was like a problem. Maybe when he comes back, he'll give me a whipping as usual, and then life will go on. But actually, he was serious, so he actually helped me pack the bag so that the car can go out. So after he helped me pack the bag, he actually locked the door. So, so I had to find my way out. And um, my only way out was actually to find somebody that can relate to my situation, which at the time was this young boy called Peter. And then he helped me out, and then that's how I survived. I mean, the amazing part about that, that life journey, and, and I mentioned the whole growth process on purpose because you'll find as an underlying theme in the book how there's an element of rejection that he has and how there is no love and no acceptance and a couple of people come into his life who promise him a lot of things but it's always difficult for you Deco to to understand who you must trust you know if if your dad is there and he chucks you out um, mom kind of gives you off to uh, Oprah Kenneth and then Bra Kenneth now has enough of you then there's a Stephen M. Gune that comes into the picture uh, who all also now claims that he discovered Deco Modise um, and there's different layers. I mean, we'll get to uh, Pizom Siman and the phone call that he made to you, but feeling rejected, that's literally what I picked up in the early stages up until the end. Why do you think you were that rejected kid? I actually didn't know, actually. It was very, very confusing and it was heartbreaking for me because I felt like... Um, if my sister and my brother can stay in the same house, why is it difficult for me to actually stay in the same house? And uh, of course, I was too young to ask questions about that. But then I had to move around a lot and I accepted that. So I knew that uh, from the jump that even if I do make friends, it's not gonna last long because I'm actually gonna move somewhere else. 
So um, I actually made peace with it that I knew that uh, everybody that comes into my life will eventually go away. Because if it, if it can happen, because that's how I felt at the time, if it can happen with my parents, and then who are you to come into my life and stay? So I actually made peace with it and accepted that. So everywhere where, where I lived, I knew that uh, it's not going to last forever. So when actually when Kenneth did, because Kenneth, what he wanted to do, was he just wanted to cash in with me because he was forcing me to go for trials. And then um, he, he just wanted to make money out of me. So when that didn't happen, actually got frustrated as well. So I knew that I wasn't going to stay there for long because he also came in like, just like my dad. It was on a Wednesday, actually, I remember very well. He actually said to me, listen, dude, like you staying here now, it's, 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 it's overdue, so you need, to, you need to go back home. And uh, bear in mind that where is home? So I can't relate to anything that has to do with home. So I had to also make another plan as well to talk to another guy that owns another team so that I can stay with him. That's how, when I got spotted, actually, I was staying with that guy. So actually what, what, what Kenneth was doing actually, and Steve actually also, it wasn't, it wasn't a surprise for me because it happened to me with my dad. So if my dad can do that, I mean, I mean. Now, the title of the book, The Curse of Deco Medisa, Nikolaus, uh, I mean, for you, when you're sifting through the possibilities of landing a title, and you look at a player that has been gifted more than most, who has played for some of the top teams in the country, played for the national team, being the poster boy of the only World Cup that there ever was on the continent. And then you say, the curse of Tiko Modise. How did we arrive at this curse? So <clears throat> it was just something that kept coming up over and over and over again. And, um, you know, it started off when, uh, when Deco was first kicked out of home and then uh, when his mother took him in again, uh, they thought he was bewitched at first and he had to undergo a couple of rituals. And then, and then it went on, you would know Robert from, uh, from the times when he was playing for Super Sports United and then Orlando Pirates. Everyone was saying, you know what, Deco is always the best player at our club, but uh, whenever he's at our club, we're not winning trophies. And you know how superstitious South African footballers are as well. And, you know, when he would leave, suddenly teams would start winning trophies. And um, this curse, this so-called curse, all came undone, uh, obviously, when he moved to Mamelodi Sundowns and cleaned up. Um, and then, you know, there's even, there's even two freaky chapters in the middle of the book that you'll see where Teko comes into, counter, uh, into contact with a, a king from Congo as well. <clears throat> also discussing uh, a curse and all that. <laughs> So it just kept coming up. And then one day I, I met Teko in a meeting. I was like, listen, bro, Teko, I've got an idea. Yeah. I don't think you're going to like it, though. Um, I think we need to call your book The Curse of Teko Modise. And uh, Teko said to me, he said, listen, there's nothing that can offend me if you think it's the right decision. And it certainly is a catchy title. And um, he said, let's go for it. Why not? Because at the end of the day, it's actually an ironic title. Because, you know, we think he's cursed, but then... Look at the man that sits in front of us today. He's anything but cursed. So that's how it turned out. Well, I mean, just to put the people at ease, though, towards the end of the book, you do summarize it and you do give the context quite nicely about the curse as well. I, I want to jump because the chronology of everything is not going to be possible tonight. So we'll take little bits and pieces here. And you talk about the honesty of the man. Here you are. You are at Orlando Pirates. They believe, please correct me, Jomasona, if I'm wrong, but they believe in Muti, do they not? <laughs> uh, correct me, Sheikh Mashaba, if I'm wrong, but uh, uh, who else is there? Uh, Jackson, is Jackson here? Jackson, okay. Uh, he's, he's a bit too new. He might lose his contract. <laughs> I'm talking about self, self-made people now who... They, they believed in Muti. Don't be scared. It's, it's, it's in the book, so... Yeah, yeah, we did. We, we, we used to bath a lot. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but... but but the funny part was, not, not at the time it worked, because I remember we went to, to, to go and play in PE. I don't remember the team that was based in PE. We, in the dressing room, there was a stick, and that stick had fire, so we had to jump over the stick to go and play. We lost 2-0. <laughs> 
and then the following weekend, uh, I think we played uh, a home game. I think it was, we were using Johannesburg Stadium. Um, there was some kind of an ointment, like looked like Vaseline, so we had to apply actually on top of your eyebrows. We lose 2 1. So they, so they always change every week, so we, they end up bringing something that we had to drink. We lost 3 1. So, so now they, there, was, there was an argument of whether they need to chase this guy away to bring another one who's new. And uh, he'll claim that he'll go back home and try and find something that is new. And whenever he's away, we'll start winning. So we actually, we started reducing using Muti and starting playing our own game. But what was in the, what was in the bath? I wouldn't know. Completely. What was the concoction that was in the bath? It was something that is very black. <laughs> OK. So give a visual image here, yeah, because, and we're all semi-adults here. Yeah. No, so you, you literally strip naked, and then you, how many of you get inside the bath? The whole team. <laughs> no, let me, let me say it this way. What used to happen was um, uh, the night before the game, when we were in camp, around midnight, we'll be, we'll be called upon to maybe one room where we'll go in and, and, and take a bath and then we go back to our rooms. But what we used to do is like when you go back to our rooms, you actually take a shower before you sleep. So now the Muti men realize that, um, I don't know who snitched us, and then the Muti men realize that actually these guys are taking a shower before they sleep. So clearly believe that this Muti is not gonna work properly. So now they changed now for, after the pre match meal is about to go to the stadium, you have to go in and bath. So you can imagine how itchy it is from the hotel to the game. And when you get to the game, your socks also, they're, it's, they're wet and they've got stuff inside. So you have to play with all those things and, and be able to produce uh, uh, results. When you say it was itchy, what was itchy? I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. We're all going to queue up there to go buy the book. So we just need to understand. Now the whole, the, body, itch. the whole body was itchy because we didn't also, I don't think anybody, none of the players knew exactly what was in the bath because um, uh, we just did what we, what we were told to do. And uh, if you didn't do what you're supposed to do, obviously it's got its own uh, punishment and all that stuff. But, um, but I think also it's, 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 it's within the culture of Orlando Paris because I found it there and I'm sure there's guys that played before me that also found the culture like that. So, so for us, as long as, as long as it's not in the system and it's outside, it was easy to do that. It was easy to, cause, to manipulate the system because that's why we could actually take a bath there and actually go to the, back, uh, to the room and actually take a proper bath. So we find the loopholes in the system and then we'll manipulate. Hey, yeah. You, you, you'll get in the book, there was a meeting that was called uh, Deco and the chairman of Orlando Pirates, Ivan Koza. And it was at a stage where he thought, finally, they're going to release me to go to Greece, to England. And when he gets there, they find out that the meeting is about socks. Literally what he just spoken. I'm going to leave it right there. If you're interested, you'll find out. I want to talk about some of the newsworthy things that you talk about in the book. Now, very few of us, when we get bored, decide to go buy an Aston Martin. <laughs> but that was the mind and your mindset. Was it pre or post the World Cup? Where you felt completely bored. <laughs> and you were... I, I think your spirit, your everything was down. But then you went and bought a car that not too many people were happy that you bought the car. You were even being instructed to go and sell it, etc. Talk me through that. I mean, what, what was that dynamic all about? Um, I mean, um, after the World Cup, because I felt like I didn't, I didn't play as well, and there was so much expectations of me. And uh, of course, I'm a human being, and I felt like um, I disappointed myself, first of all, and the people that had so much hype and hope. And then, um, just after the World Cup, I was just sitting at a home with um, a couple of my friends then. Um, um, I told them that, hey, Prophet, I need to just buy something that will make me feel better. And uh, knowing my friends then, they, they just agree in everything because 
I, I was buying food and everything for them, so they had to agree. So, uh, and then I saw an ad, I was, I was going through the internet and I saw an ad actually where the Austin Martin was for sale. I didn't even think twice about it. And um, I went on to buy it. And uh, I think the mistake that I did actually was uh, we invited at the Nike Center in Pimville. And um, I went there with the car. So I think that day uh, there was a picture that was taken. And then the following day, um, when Jasmine called, I knew exactly what he was going to talk about. And I tried to avoid his calls. And then he kept on calling because he's very persistent. So he asked me if I bought the. He's asking me as if he doesn't know because he knows. He's like, hey, Fiti, can we talk about the lost in Martin? I'm like, no, I didn't buy it. So he was like, okay, cool, I was surprised. So now I know exactly that he doesn't like the idea that I bought the car. So um, because after the World Cup, there's certain things that we needed to discuss, more especially because the overseas move didn't happen, so we needed to, to have a contingency plan. So he, he would call me and say, look, listen, I'm going to come to your house. Okay, cool. So now I need to move my car because now Jasmine is coming. Luckily, two houses, three houses away, there was an open space, so I had to go and park the car, then come back home. So I knew that the first thing that he's going to do is actually going to check the garage, but he's not going to actually go there. So what I did was when he came in, I opened the garage, I used the garage so that he can come in, so they can see the car is not there. <laughs> so um, I, 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 I got away with that for, for quite a while until the season opened, so we had to go back to London Pirates and train. And because that car actually made me happy, and then I started going to training with it, and then that's when the problem started. But why, why was it a problem? Was it a problem because it, it might make your teammates think that there's a, a wage discrepancy where you are maybe earning millions while some of them are earning 2,000? I wish I was earning millions, but... <laughs> How much was the car? I will fit. <laughs> You must understand that uh, it was actually my second time being in trouble with the car because I remember um, me and Ukatla Mashiach were driving. I was driving a Range Rover and Maute was driving a Jeep SRT8. So the problem was um, we we coming with a super sport mentality to bring it to London Pirates. And at the time, I think uh, a lot of players also wanted their contracts to be amended as well. So they wanted better salaries and all that stuff. So us bringing and driving all those cars, it didn't help the team because now players thinking that, okay, if they can pay Mauta this, if they can pay Tiko this, which means they can pay me. So bringing Austin Martin as well, it was just a worst case scenario for me. And then I was called into an office actually to be told that, listen, bro, you need to, you need to sell that car or you don't have to come with it to training anymore. But I was very angry and bitter with the team, so I didn't care until actually I had to care. Jersey number 10. Please. Was promised to you yeah, at Orlando Pirates. Mm -hmm. Was jersey number 10 delivered to you? There were so many excuses about that jersey, actually. I remember my contract was up, and um, uh, me and Jess were, 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 um, were discussing possibilities of moving away from Pirates. And, um, and then Jasmine gave me a call. I'm like, hey, my brother, I want to give you jersey number 10. They wanna. But they busy uh, speaking to Jom about it. So we'll come back to you in about the jersey number 10. So I remember um, for me to actually to get that jersey, I needed to sign a new contract. And I had to make uh, a decision then that if, if, do I really want to still play for Orlando Pirates? And the answer was no. And uh, would, I, would, I, would I like to wear jersey number 10 for Orlando Pirates? Of course, yes. But then I had to, I had to I actually be realistic about certain issues because I knew then even if I did renew my contract, I wasn't going to stay, I wasn't going to play anyway because of the issues that I had with the team. And I don't think anything that, um, that they could have given me would have helped me actually to come back and try and play for the team. You know, and uh, it's, it's pointless actually to be part of Orlando Pirates group and uh, when you're given an opportunity to play and then you don't produce the results because there was so much expectations of me so I didn't want to rob myself because I was already you know, um, I'm labeled as uh, like um, 
bad boy and then because of McDonald's deals and all that stuff, but people actually didn't realize and understand the things that I had to go through actually to, to try and fight with the team every single day. And actually after that, I had to go and report for training. When you go to training, the coach tells you that you can't train because you need to be back in the office. When you go to the office, there's nobody at the office. And then you look at the, the following day, the news are saying you're AWOL, but you're actually there. You know, so those are the kind of issues that I had to deal with. But at the time, there, was, there wasn't a proper channel for me to actually express those kind of feelings. And uh, what I wanted to do actually was to find a way without fighting with the team, without fighting with the chairman as well, to find a common ground for me to leave Orlando Pirates with peace. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Sonner, did they consult you for jersey number 10? We just want to get it out there. <laughs> Sorry, because my feet are working. Um, <laughs> Very quickly, this is just, did they consult you and why did you refuse? No, I was, ne I was never consulted and actually it was not up to me about jersey number 12. It's to Orlando Pirates just decided to, to retire the jersey, so I think they were trying to catch him to sign a contract. Did he deserve to wear jersey number 10? He deserved it. Thank you so much. And another, another legend of 50 caps, 397 appearances at Chiefs has just walked in. Mr. Dr. Kumala, good to see you. He is now making sure Baroka FC are top of the table. And Cabo Zondo, good to see you. Give him a big round of applause. MEC of, of sport, but officially they've given him a title as MEC of education. <laughs> uh, but in future he'll be Minister of Sport. Panya <laughs> Zalesuf. That's your hero there. You, you never knew what this guy looked like. Everybody talked about him like he was God. Everybody talked about him until you saw him and you were amazed and you wanted to be Dr. Kumal. Yeah. What was that like and from the moment that you actually got to meet him? Actually, um, the first time I was supposed to meet him actually never happened and I was very, very disappointed because um, we were selected at, um, in Soweto. There was 22 players that were selected actually. 11 had to train with um, the Brazilian team and the other 11 had to train with the South African team. And um, well, luckily enough, I was part of the guys that I had to train with the South African team a day before the game. So we were given opportunities to be on the pitch the same guys as them. So um, we were given like um, every five minutes you can spend uh, five minutes with a certain player and then you can move on, probably maybe three players and then they, they had to resume for training as well. But the problem was it was a mess when you got into the pitch. You know, um, everyone ran to doctor. And I was like, can I curse? Oh, please, this, this is your day, you I can. I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I couldn't, I didn't get that opportunity. Yeah. And uh, luckily for me, I got an opportunity to actually uh, be uh, with, uh, with um, Shuz Mushewu. And I had an opportunity as well with him um, and and I don't remember the other guy as well. And uh, from that day on, actually, it made sense to me because how the kids actually reacted when they saw a doctor. I was like, I just, if I can't be at the same level as him, I just want to be below him. It just because I realized then that what he meant for me, it's not only me, there's other kids as well that he meant something to them, but it's just that I chose to do something about it. I wanted, to be, I wanted to be better, I wanted to be somebody and uh, at the time then I started being obsessed about it and I started finding out what he does and how he plays, you know, all those kind of stuff and uh, how he behaves as well off the pitch. So it kind of like, um, it molded me to become what I wanted to be and uh, when I had an opportunity to actually play for Bafana Bafana, it was a dream come true because he played for a national team as well, you know, I, I, I watched him when they qualified for the World Cup, I watched him when they went to to the half corner zone. Well. So for me to actually have that opportunity to wear the Fana jersey, even if I, I, I couldn't wear it again, just for the fact that I wore it once, it was, it was, it was enough for me. And uh, so 
that's why I say in the book, like uh, he he has done so much for me, but without even realizing that, he, like he's actually saved my life because at the time I had nobody to look up to. So every player to me at the time they were the same. They all wanted to do the same thing, and uh, but I could see the reaction when everybody speaks about doctor. So I just wanted people to uh, to to have the uh, the same reaction as well when they speak about me. Amazing, amazing story, and. What I'll do is I'm going to start wrapping up because of time, and then I'll, I'll allow you on the floor as well to ask a couple of questions uh, before we disappear and allow you to get the book and get it signed by Tico. Um, like with every superstar, and, and we see so many documentaries, the rise and fall, the rise and fall of this one, the rise and fall of that one, and being a great athlete and being a great superstar that you are, crazy things like alcohol, come into the picture. You have nobody to turn to but a bottle store. I am not think. No, you, you laugh. This is, this is serious. I mean, it, it does not declare you an alcoholic, but it declares you finding a new friend, but a friend that is equally destructive to you. What was that period like? Because you would have lost yourself a few times when you found yourself making mistakes because of the influence? What was driving you to that? Um, what drove me to that, I think actually it was the frustration that I had because the only thing that I wanted to do, I just wanted to be heard. I just needed somebody from Alano Prize to actually sit with me and actually hear my kind of a story because I joined Alano Prize with, with the dream that if being given an opportunity to go overseas, I will, because the aim was if I get an opportunity to go overseas, it will better my life, it will better my family's life. And uh, bear in mind that before me, there was other guys as well that played for London Pirates. They had an opportunity to go overseas, it was never an issue. So the first season of playing for London Pirates, there were offers, there was two offers in Greece, and then they said, no, you need to, you need to wait for footballing countries, like your Spain, your England, and they're all okay. So now, what's an excuse now? So now, nobody wanted to talk to me. People were making excuses. And uh, the only frustration that I had was I was blaming Jasmine for everything because I thought Jasmine could, because he's my manager, he needed to sort it out. And besides Jasmine, there was no one else that I could talk to. And uh, the only thing, the best thing that I could do was actually go to my house and via liquor store there and buy a couple of stuff. <laughs> And be nice, but 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 at, at that time I didn't realize how how how, how bad it was yeah. because I was I was in a dark space. I was it was very bad, and uh, it didn't help as well to have the friends that I had at the time as well. You know, instead of them trying me, trying to show me the way, trying to uplift me or some some sort, but they were just happy that Nando's is always coming through and uh, McDonald's is always coming through. So. Goli put. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually, I, I find comfort in alcohol, and um, actually, it took it, it took people a while to actually know that I actually drink alcohol because I, I didn't used to go to clubs. So my club was my house. So I would actually pull out the cars out of the garage and buy as many booze as I can and just sit there. Even if I do get drunk, nobody will know. But then it, it's it's got its own uh, disadvantages as well. So I remember as well doing that for like six to seven months or so. And uh, I had a reason actually to do so because I was training behind the post. It was very disturbing for me. I won two footballers of the year back, in, back to back. The next thing I'm training behind the post without no reason, but just because I wanted to leave. And then, then when that happened, ob obviously you find some comfort somewhere. So, so I turned my house into a club. That was very, very nice at the time. And uh, it actually affected me in so many ways. It affected my relationship that I had at the time as well, it affected my relationship with Jasmine because I remember not speaking to Jasmine for about a year. He will call and I will switch off my phone and change my numbers, you'll find them as well. So actually to, to, to see Jazz actually here and uh, me being with Jazz for such a long time, I mean, it's, it's a story on its own, you know. And uh, I was a very difficult person to deal with at the time because I felt like I was robbed an opportunity to, to become a better player, to become a better person, to better lives of people that are around me, because I know where I'm coming from. And uh, I thought at the time that Orlando Paris would give me that opportunity, 
but I'm, I'll, I'll never be uh, uh, ungrateful for having that opportunity to play for Lana Prize because it actually made people realize my talent as well. So I'll be forever grateful for playing for Lana Pirates. All right, I'll get a comment from you, Nicholas, in just a second. Um, while we get the microphone, just put up your hand. We'll get a microphone through to you. Just mention your, uh, just your name if you're representing a media house. Mention that as well. Uh, I wanted to find out, seeing that you didn't talk to Jasmine for a year, then in the book you don't talk to Pito for two years. Um, so you are Tiko, don't talk, Modisa. Um, <laughs> How does, it, how does it work out that the person, that one person who made the first phone call to you and said, come to my team, Supersport, you dodged them. That same person that said, come to my team at Sundowns, you dodged them. And then you find him at the national team as an assistant coach to Carlos Alberto Pereira, head of the 2010 FIFA World Cup. For two years. I mean, you're one of the star players in the team. Um, maybe, yeah, thanks, Nicola. What was going on there? I think the, the problem started when, um, after winning uh, Sports Personality of the Year and Midfield of the Year, I think uh, we had a meeting at Sundowns. Um, I remember the team, uh, three of the coaches, they actually uh, called me in and then they told me something that is very, very confusing and I'm still confused to this day. They said to me, I mean, Brian, you need to play less so that the team can shine. Like, that was very, very confusing for me. I remember... Sorry, just repeat that. I need to uh, play uh, less. Okay. There's a lady that didn't hear you. It's confused me already. No, I was, yeah. I, was, I was actually told that I need to play less for the team to shine. And uh, because it was said three times, it was a thrill there. It was very confusing at the time, and I remember actually having this conversation with Jess, like, this is very confusing to me. They say I must play less so that the team can shine. I don't know how to play less, you know, and uh, I, I was playing football the only way I knew how. And uh, I think that's when the problem started, because after that, my relationship with the coach started being bad, and um, it came to a point, it comes to a point where, actually there's a lot of stuff that is not written in the book, I'm sure, Nick has got like two hours of recording that we can actually make. Uh, we can make the second book actually. But it's just that we, we uh, the certain things that uh, that happened. And as a footballer, when you see them happening in front of you, they're very hurtful. And I felt like at so many times that I felt like um, I was I was made an example of other guys. If there's something that needs to be proven, it is it is only me, you know. And uh, and it's very bad actually to to go to a training pitch where you you you. You, you see this person every day, and uh, he actually has conversation with everybody else but you. And it's not because of maybe I was uh, maybe seeking attention or something. We, we can stay without having con uh, conversations with each other, but the, the problem was that to a certain point where we in camp will play games, where you know in camp there's like pool table, there's table tennis there. If, if I come in and play, he'll walk away. That's how bad it was, and uh, now, now you start you start, uh, you start having questions now from other players. And then the funny part was, the, the players were is, they actually asked me if are we dating the same chick? Because, 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 it's true though, because it was very, very disturbing. No, he's married, comrade, he's done. Why are you drinking with I'm just thirsty, how? No, it was actually very, very disturbing. And for me, I, 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 I had to, to, to be a professional about it and, uh, and, and work as hard as I could and, and, and do what I'm supposed to do. But it came to a point where I was like, I don't want to disrespect the coach because he's coached me for so many years and uh, he's a legend in the game. He has achieved so much. And uh, let, let me not fight with him because now it will actually give an opportunity for other players to disrespect him. So let's, let's rather find a common ground in part ways. And I remember actually being called in a meeting um, about, about that. So there was three of them, so I was actually waiting for them to actually give me an explanation because I didn't actually want for an explanation. I just told them that, hey guys, listen, I can see that um, I don't have an opportunity to play here because if you can convert a, a left back into my position when I'm there, I'm not injured, clearly you're telling me something. So I, I understand and clearly maybe if, also, if I was a coach, I'll probably do the same thing. So can I excuse myself and go and find a team that I can play for? They never answered me. The only thing that they did, they was just writing in their notepad. Nothing was said. So now I actually walked out of the meeting that there was no 
conclusion whatsoever. So it was, it was just a very confusing time, especially the last two years at Sundance. It was very, very confusing because I didn't know whether I'm still valued as a player at Sundance or not. Because at the end of the day, I didn't want to be a brand ambassador. I didn't want to be important only when the supporters are around. We need to launch a jersey somewhere. So I'm in front. When you have to play, I'm at the back. So I didn't want to be that. And I still wanted to play football. And uh, I felt like um, I, I came into this game uh, uh, knowing exactly what I wanted to do. So if I have to retire, it has to come from me, not because of the situation that I'm in. So I felt like if I had to stay there, that situation actually was going to force me to retire. Because I remember telling Jasmine that if I have to renew a contract with Sanders, I'd rather retire. That's how bad it was. Yeah, it, it does get quite hectic in the book. Um, I, I leave the rest for your eyeballs. Um, and, and there's a great deal. I mean, there's the, there's the chapter with Joel Santana. Uh, there's the issue about Rudy Kroll. Uh, th there's so much there in terms of just substance and things that you wanted to know about and never quite got an opportunity. Sorry, there was a hand that was there earlier on. Sorry for the delay. Hi, um, Tande Hile Nyembezi from Vision View Productions. Um, I've spent a lot of time interviewing Dicko throughout his career. So one last question. Um, you've got a lot of pressure on you because you've had a lot of endorsements. You've had a lot of hype. You have been the guy for so long. So one, are you going to study? Are you studying something? Um, have you started preparing for life after football? Two. Have you made investments? Because if you're buying Astons, and we all love an Aston, <laughs> but we also want to know that, you know, we don't want to hear Hore Otaba broke when you're like 55 or something. So those are my two questions. Are you studying? Are you making plans for life after football? And have you made investments for the future? Thanks. Great question. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know how you, how did you know he's turning 55 next year? Okay, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I've got a diploma. <laughs> yeah, um, to be honest as well, let me, let me address this first. People have people another perception that when you're a footballer, you, you're earning so much money. And they, they fail to understand that in, in, in football, when you enter, when you play to a team, you're getting paid according to how you play. So. And as black people, the first thing that you do with your first contract, you know, go back home and fix. So you're actually spending so much time trying to fix it at home. Once you're 30, 29, 30, you, you're trying to buy your own house. You're 33, 34, you have to retire. So I think that's the cycle that it's, it's been happening with so many foot, footballers. Because so, people thinking that the footballers, say they're wasting so much money, not, not understanding that the salary is way too sometimes. They, 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 they don't meet the way Melis Pilang are calling because people will think, Dori, I bought an Austin Martin, I didn't buy cash. Uh, it's exactly the same thing. People are thinking Austin Martin is two million. No, it was not. It was not even a million bucks. But just because. I mean, just tell, tell us how much it was so that ah. we, 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 we get it over and done with. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's history now. No, man. What, what, what were you paying per month for it? It was, a, it, it was a bad movie, so it's, it's, it's one thing that I, I really regret doing. I was playing 22. 22K for the car? Okay. No, he's ah, honest. We see. We see. Like, like you don't make mistakes. We see. No, I, I've asked him to be honest, so give him a big round of applause for the honesty, please. I know someone's like, yo, hey, 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 the school fees, hey, what, what? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was bad, like, I've spent so much money on the car, but uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't drive it for six months, so it was a, it, it was very short-lived, actually, and, um, and the Jasmine is, Jasmine will tell you that I'm a big spender, actually, and uh, I don't know where you get that from, but anyway, that's a topic for another day. But, uh, but in all fairness and in all honesty, like it was a mistake that I did and uh, I believe that, uh, that uh, so many footballers were all doing the same mistakes and I think it's a generational curse as well because the first thing that we do as footballers when you get that contract, when you get that better money, we want to buy a car, merely because we want to be looking good inside the car. At that time, you're still staying at home, you're staying in the flat that is rented uh, for you by the team. So we're actually doing so many mistakes and... Uh, I think uh, maybe me telling my own story as well, it will 
you know, try and inspire the other ones as well to make them understand that it was not all smooth sailing for me. I was not giving things on a silver platter. I had to struggle for those kind of things, and uh, I've done my own fair mistake, share of mistakes as well. So it happens, and I've learned from them. And uh, I strongly believe that if Jasmine was not around at the time, I don't think I would even had an opportunity to go play for Sundance because many people that actually face uh, smaller kind of problems, they don't come back and play football because of. We don't, we, we, they don't have other figures. We all, we, don't, we all come from a similar background, if we check a little bit. So sometimes we, we, we think that just because somebody's a superstar, it's fine, it's driving a Mercedes Benz, it's fine, it's got no issues. Only to realize that actually there's bigger issues than what you see. Because you come into the game to only to watch the game for 90 minutes. You don't know what I'm going through. I had to switch off so that I can focus on the game for 90 minutes. After that, I had to switch on to, to, my, to, my, to my real problems. Because when I was married as well, I felt like I was in prison. If that's prison, I don't want to go to prison, comrade, because I felt like I was in prison. And that's my own house. Like, I, at some point, I had to actually sleep in the car, just to have a peace of mind. So imagine sleeping in the car. Do you know how comfortable that is? I know I'm skinny, but it's very comfortable. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. So if, if I had to go through that and, uh, and, and, and having to come to training as well and behave like everything is normal, it was, it was, it was very scary because I didn't know actually where I got the strength from. And uh, it, was, it was something that I had to do because I didn't want anybody to see that I actually have issues and stuff like that. I just wanted to, prove it, to put a brave face and actually do what I'm supposed to do. And there's so many games as well that I won for the team, still having those kind of issues as well because, I mean, um, it was what it was in the house. I mean, do you think you would have been in prison with Linky? I Robert. Okay, sorry, another question. Um, you got... Oh, sorry. Hey, the ledgers have got the mic. Shh. Uh, on, on a lighter note, uh, I, I have something which uh, has been bothering me with Deco for many, many years. And uh, it, it's an opportunity for me to ask him. Uh, when you were, Deco, when you were playing for that amateur team, what do you call it? The amateur team? City Pillars. Yeah, you were playing for Pillars, you. <laughs> and I came to watch you play in Petersburg. You. <laughs> and in Petersburg, I was impressed with you. You. <laughs> and uh, after the game, I sent uh, Steve, the late Steve Mguni to you. And uh, you agreed to meet me somewhere because uh, how I scout, I always scout by coming with an old Volkswagen or hide myself under the trees. That's what I used to do. And uh, Steve brought you under the tree. You. <laughs> we negotiated me and you. We shook hands. And then you said to me, no. It was under the tree. I'm still sitting under the tree. No, this is, this is true. No, this is true. The leaves were falling all over my head and I'm sitting there. And then, take after four hours, I understand you at the corner there. You were negotiating with Pizzo. <laughs> and then later on, I discovered you signed for Super Sport. Was it the issue of, you know, Cosmos that time, there was a perception that we don't pay that well. <laughs> was it because the, at Super Sport, they offered you a lot of uh, decoders? <laughs> but... I was going to give him number 10, boy. Pendula <laughs> uh, you. Um, yeah, I remember very well, Brajay. Um, yes, I met Brajay and we, we agreed on the numbers. 
but there's one thing that Bajay told me actually. He said to me, um, I think at the time he just signed Uye, yeah. and then Bajay said to me, you're not my type of a player, but I just want to sign you so you can play here for one season and then I can sell you elsewhere. That was for me was enough. But the problem was at the time, I'm from City Pillars. I just won the player of the year. I want to go to a team that will guarantee me game time. And I knew that at Cosmos I would play. But then, because I disappointed Upito the first time around, I didn't want to do it the second time around. And at the time, Super Sport actually had so many young players and they were playing, all of them. And uh, most of them were actually in the, in the Bafana setup already. So for me, I thought what well, Super Sport would give me an opportunity to be in the Bafana team. It had nothing to do with the numbers. It's not like at Super Sport I was earning much. It was actually the same amount of money that I was earning in Gomvena. So there was nothing to it. But it, for me, it was, I was happy because I was given an opportunity. It wasn't because I didn't want to play for Braje at all. And I remember actually when after signing with, with Supersport, uh, we had, when we had to play Cosmos, I was actually scared to go and shake hands with Braje because <laughs> I thought he was still angry. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it, was, it had nothing to do with the numbers and stuff like that. It's just that I felt um, that I, I didn't want to disappoint Peter. And I actually had this conversation with my sister because I was staying in my sister's house at the time. And then, um, yeah, Peter was, was very persistent. He was calling me like, so many times in a day, and uh, he would coach me actually without even signing for, 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 for Super Sport. He would tell me, you must, you must watch what that, and that time I haven't even signed with him. But I think it was also the passion that he had as well for the game, and uh, I think at the time that's something that I needed as well. You know, I needed to be coached. Not that Braji wasn't going to coach me, but it just that I didn't, I, I just felt at the time that Super Sport would give me that opportunity that I needed, and, and, and to be honest, it actually did. Okay. I I'll organize a lunch for the two of you. Um, secret location. We got a, a question there. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name's Leon. I'm a, I'm a football fan. Um, so it's not really a question, it's just really a short comment to say that um, we've all, always admired you as a soccer player and as being a great ambassador for this country. And it takes an incredible amount of bravery to expose yourself through your book to the lows and the highs of your life. Everyone always celebrates the, the highs, but it's always at the lows where you, your true greatness shines through. So thank you for being so honest and being such a great ambassador. Thank you very much. Sorry, w while you're there, um, because you're the father of the, the author, how does it feel and how proud are you to see your son here on stage having put together a book which will be a, a blockbuster seller in terms of the whole country. It's already got people talking right now. How does that make you feel as a parent? Um, yeah, I didn't want to raise that issue. But no, no, uh, I'm, 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 the thing yeah, is I'm here, so I don't didn't worry. want to I, take it away from Nick or from Tiako. But uh, I, I took Nick and uh, his older brother, George, to his first Soweto derby when he was five. And um, he was bitten from that moment. Being in a, the F&B stadium full of uh, like 90,000 people plus, he always wanted to be, uh, to be part of South African soccer. So for, for, for me and for my wife, as, as uh, his parents, we're incredibly proud. And I'll tell you a little funny story because uh, people, you know, in South Africa, people always have parallel teams. So we say, who's your favorite team? They'd say to Nick. And you'd say, Kaiser Chiefs. So if you look carefully, he's actually got a, t a Chiefs tattoo on his arm. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so the, the, the standard response would be, no, 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 we mean a real team. And he goes, uh, no, Kaiser Chiefs. No, we mean in, in, the, in the PSL. You know? And he, he knows what they're talking about, so you'd hook him. And you'd say, no, Kaiser Chiefs. I don't know, I mean in England. He says, I don't support a team in England. I only support Kaiser Chiefs. And so we're incredibly proud that he together with you, Teko, are ambassadors of this fantastic country of ours and the football that we produce. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And, and, and the nice thing is that uh, you got two Kaiser Chiefs supporters sitting here because they both supported Kaiser Chiefs. Uh, so talk about Kaiser Chiefs. Let me welcome Spiro Shabalala at the back, Bran Baloi at the back. Thank you so much for coming to support. I know Shab is standing on top of like two boxes, but I could say. Um, sorry, there's a question coming through from somewhere. Oh, um, my name is Delight. 
And um, I first saw Dico 13 years ago, because as you guys said, you used to play for City Pillars, and that's my whole Dunkongo. So um, on behalf of the kids who are currently in academies and uh, in academies and all, Dico, if you were to look back in your career, you know, 17 years back, you know, what advice would you give, you know, 17 year olds today in terms of like the pitfalls of soccer, you know, what comes with the fame, fortunes, and you know, the dreams and dilemma. And secondly, this is a compliment. To be honest, we've never had the chance to see the likes of DK and Mjomana, but then to the players that we've laid our eyes on, you're truly handpicked and you are a marvel to watch. And as you retire, salute Rao Rao. Thank you. Thank you. And retire some faith. To be honest with you, when I didn't, I didn't know that um, actually being famous is going to happen. And um, I didn't also know that I'll actually make the mistakes that I did. And uh, I think also it's important all the time to have a father figure around you. And uh, for me, uh, it happened at a later stage when uh, I was about to be a professional footballer at the time. And you can understand the patterns and the habits that I already had when growing up. So it was very, very difficult to, to transition from doing things on my own to actually listening to, to Jasmine. Because Jasmine is Jasmine. When we met Jasmine, the Jasmine, like the office was this, this big. That's how it was. But he was a very, very ambitious person at the time. And I didn't believe in Jasmine at the first time. And, uh, Actually, if, if, if there's one thing that actually I, I regret not doing is, is not actually um, telling Jasmine how, 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 how proud I am because of him and uh, how fortunate we are, especially the players that are managed by him. Because he's not just the manager, you know, he, he's, he's everything to you and uh, he treats every player the same way irrespective of the team that you're playing for. So, and uh, I think in this game as well, there's a lot of agents that are doing things wrong. You only see him when there's time for signing on fees and stuff like that. They actually leave the player to, to face their own struggles. But Jasmine has always been there, not only me, and I think also Shabat also can attest, because me and Shabat I think probably have 12 to 13 years with Jasmine as well. So he's, he's always been the kind of a guy that uh, you can call him for anything at any time, and he's always available for, for everyone. Uh, so yeah, so I think maybe if there's one regret, it's, it's actually not appreciating Jasmine as much as I could. Yeah. Is that his real name, though? His real name is Justice. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Amen. Um, we got a final question at the back there, please. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, Tiko and everybody. Uh, my name is Lisiba Duaba from 1912 Online Radio. Uh, Tiko, uh, building up to the Confederation Cup here in our country, and then the World Cup. Uh, in the streets, the talk was all about you. Uh, even the World Cup, it was like, uh, it was a, this will be a, a Tigo World Cup. And then the Confed Cup, well, I would say, we felt that, that you didn't show up. Uh, coming to the World Cup, Tigo still didn't show up. And I'm asking so this question because I think it is a, it is a problem here in our country. In big matches, our players, they don't show up. And I'm also asking this question because, because uh, the old, all the coaches which are here today, I hope that uh, we're in their training, they would instill some corners to our players so that when we play big matches, they will show up and then have that aggressiveness and arrogance to, to, to have the need of wanting to win the matches. So my question to you is that when it came to the World Cup, uh, you were doing so well to honor Pirates. I remember there's a, there's a game you also played for Bafana Bafana when we played against Cameroon. You scored a brace and missed the penalty. Uh, you were on fire. Uh, we had so much expectations. What is it that you felt maybe had uh, sort of way uh, left you in those big moments? Thank you. You're not trying to. Okay. I didn't show up. The last question is open. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, sure. Um, actually, I think I think because of oh. the high expectations of me, um, it has made people to put me on a different pedestal. And then every game that I played, it was scrutinized in such a way that even if I had a good game, it's a bad game. 
So I sometimes remember telling Nick that my, my average performance sometimes is a man of the match for an ordinary player. Just because of the ex expectations that everybody had. Confederation Cup, the first game, I was the man of the match, but nobody speaks about it. So it's just that people at that time, because there was so much expectation that were put on me, and it, if you remember very well, our, our preparations were playing against our African teams. In the World Cup, you're playing against people that are playing 60,000 capacity every single day. And then, and in the World Cup as well, to be honest and being fair, not to try and make an excuse. Even Ronaldo is struggling to show up at the World Cup. Even Messi himself is struggling to show up at the World Cup. World Cup is not just the stage that anybody can shine. So most of the people that you think that they can shine, sometimes they don't shine. But at the time when I needed to, to, to get support from our local people, the very same people that were in the media space, they made, they made sure that I don't shine as much as they want me to shine because maybe the chances are I was not playing for their favorite teams. I wouldn't know, but I think at the time I was, I was, I was, I was, I was criticized for stuff that I didn't actually do because um, they will find guys that are playing Maybe I'm having a better game than them, but I'll give him men of the match, not because of me. The only reason is I've got too many men of the matches. Just because it's got too much, now it's, it's a problem now. Somebody else must, must get it. It's like when, when everybody wants to be at the top, and then they'll try and encourage you and, and, and wish you well and support you. And once you become at the top, and then you stay there, you become a nuisance. Nobody wants to be at the top for that long, so now you must make space for another person. I think that was the issue, because everybody focused on the endorsement at the World Cup and the Confederation Cup. They, they forgot to, to actually look at my performances as well, because every time when they mentioned the committee said there was an endorsement after that. So it, I felt like at the time, maybe an endorsement it was my, my nickname or my last name, because everybody used that as often as they could. But I think I was unfairly just at the time, and I felt, and also it didn't help my game as well because I didn't want to talk about it because I felt that, okay, the World Cup is coming, so probably maybe I will have that kind of a performance. And, if, and to be honest, even today, I've never got men of the match without scoring a goal. So for me to be men of the match, actually, I need to score a goal. So, and other guys do play in jail. 80 minutes, 75 minutes, or get men of the matches. I'm not complaining about it, I'm just saying, that's, that's the standard that it was set for me, it was set by me actually, I'm not complaining about that and, and I'm very proud that it happened like that. But I'm just saying that if, if, if we can all be, be, be and especially the guys that played in the World Cup, if we can all be, be, be just the same way, you actually realize that most of the stuff that was said about me, they were actually unfair. And I suppose the platform of the World Cup is very difficult. Um, it's the same platform that sees a Roberto Baggio miss a penalty. It's the same platform that sees a Zinedine Zidane head by someone and gets a red card. So it, a lot of things can happen. I don't know, are we taking one more? Oh, we do have the, the final question. Yes, the final question for tonight. Hey guys, um, this is dedicated to Nico. If there's any kind of plan that you were set up for how having football should go right now in three words where should it go in three words <laughs> three words bruv listen listen to Teko <laughs> that's it I mean, talk about words. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap by literally quoting from another legend who was given an opportunity by obviously a man that is here, U Ucha Moson, and that's Benny McCarthy, who looked at Teko as a hero, but also in reverse, Teko looked at Benny as the ultimate hero. And today, Benny gets to coach this man. I mean, the ironies of life are, are quite ridiculous. Uh, but Benny says that, and you'll see this on the front of the book here, the one thing that I know is that every time I played with Tico on my side, I was never on the losing side. One of the best I've ever seen in my eyes, Tico Modise is what you call a true legend of the game. And ladies and gentlemen, give a big round of applause for the true legend. Um, I'm, I'm going to call Jasmine to come up quickly just to give us a vote of thanks just now, but when, when, the, when the doctor calls, you have to listen and break the rules slightly because you never know what the doctor has in his first aid kit. Dr. Kumal. Thanks for the opportunity.
uh, Rob. <coughs> uh, firstly, let me congratulate Tico for the great job. I think, boy, you have worked hard. Um, it's not by fluke where you are. You've touched the name of Joma, myself, and other legends. And I think it will be proper for me to say, job well done. I would be failing if I wouldn't acknowledge what you have done on the field of play. The reason why I drove all the way from Polokwane to here is because I wanted to be here to celebrate this moment with you because I think you've done a lot for South African football. And uh, one question. <clears throat> is it okay? Only one. No, let me say two. <laughs> what did the first goal mean to you? For or against? The first goal of the match. What did it mean to you? For you, for your team, or against? So I just want to know, what did it mean meant to you? The second one, how did you handle your teammates? Because I know I'm from that school. Being endorsed and being highlighted as one of the greatest of them all within the team. Obviously, not all of them were on your side. How did you manage to handle that? <clears throat> okay, um, as for my first goal as a professional football, Funny, the funny part is when I was playing for Super Sport, I never scored a goal. The first time I scored was in my first cap uh, for the national team. I think I scored two. We were playing in, uh, in Switzerland. Um, I remember the second goal, I took my jersey off because it was a dream come true for me. You know, scoring on, 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 uh, on a derby for on a derby. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was something else. And uh, for, to be given that opportunity as well, because I also touched it as well in the book that um, I was supposed to be called on to Bafana Bafana earlier than that. But Coach Peter told Perea that I wasn't ready, merely because we had some um, disagreement um, because my car had a system that was fantastic. <laughs> and that was a problem. And as for, as for dealing with, 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 with my teammates, I think that's, that's one thing that I've always struggled to deal with, even still today, um, because um, they will never look at you uh, um, um, the same way that they look at everybody else. And, uh, and uh, it's, it, becomes, it becomes difficult also to, to voice out your opinion, because when you do that, people think that you know too much or because you've got certain things. And uh, it was very, very difficult, especially when I was at, uh, at the Orlando Pirates, because I remember actually we, we were playing after playing a game in Devon, and uh, our flight was delayed. And uh, there, was, uh, there was no one else actually there to buy us food. So we had the airport, and uh, I opted to buy everybody food. I went for DC for that, for buying everybody food, merely because somebody else thought that I'm trying to to think that I'm better than everybody else. So it's kind of difficult when that position, when you're getting endorsement and then to be looked at the same way. At least now it's different now because of now it's, it's, it's popular now. You see your Ronaldo, you see your Messi, it's, it's, it's everywhere else. But back then it's, it's, it's not acceptable, you know? And, and, um, and that was actually one thing that I struggled with because you find teammates, they don't speak to you. When you, when you show up, they, they walk the different direction and uh, they only talk to you when it's in the game and the game is tough and it's difficult. They'll come to and Dr. Yazipo Nasipeto. So that was the only time. And uh, other than that, you find difficulties. And I think still, still today as well, even when I'm still at Cape Town City, it's always been a difficult thing to deal with because you don't know how to, to tell somebody else or how to advise because you don't know how they're going to take it. Because, uh, but I'm not going to stop advising. I'm not going to stop telling somebody else. As long as I'm honest about it and uh, it's the truth, then it's fine. If you take it somehow, that's you. But one thing that I've realized as well, that all the players that actually said something bad about me behind my back, they all came back again and said, actually, we are wrong. Somebody else told us this and this and this. So for me, actually, it's not a problem anymore. I just, what I do is I just go to the pitch and do what I'm supposed to do and, and, and get out of there. That's tough. It's tough. I mean, we see endorsements now. Even um, Shakes is doing endorsements. And, um, 
<laughs> we've seen uh, Doc Kumailo with status back then doing endorsements. Well, endorsements are just happening, blah, 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 right? <laughs> Actually, a good job. Job has been endorsing Puma all his life. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm going to ask everyone just to stay seated uh, after Jasmine's given a vote of thanks, uh, just to allow Deco as well as Nico to go to the back, um, where they're going to be signing the books right there uh, at the back there. So you can slip into the store, purchase your book. Uh, it's all of what, 206 Rand? So. No 99 cents. Uh, but 206, that is it. You purchase, he signs, he gives it his personal uh, stamp of approval. So le without any uh, waste of time, and I know that a couple of his players and professionals are here, Abom Shishi are here. Uh, I mean, he'll tell us who else is here. Uh, but Putiman, please, uh, everybody's waited to see who this famous jazz man is. I, I, I hand over the vote of thanks to you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, firstly, let me thank all of you for coming. I'm going to go through, or firstly, protocol must be observed. There's an MEC of education here, Mr. Panyazal Suif, Honorable MEC, please. Thank you very much. I'll come to the legends. But I think the, I need to thank you. We, I think one of the things that we, and myself, I think Nick and other players, we don't want to take for granted is all of you seated here because you could have been somewhere doing your own, running your own business. The fact that you came here, that means we mean something to you, and I want to thank you for that. Also, let me thank Teko's family, the mother, sister, and sister-in-law, and the brother. What Teko didn't tell you is that first time when I asked to go and meet the parent, he dodged me. Go and read about it. Because I, want, I don't want to meet, manage a player. I don't know the family. It becomes very difficult. So, so when I said, let's meet at, at uh, Maponya Mall, I want to go see your, your mother. Last time I checked, you were on the freeway. The next thing, the phone was off. I had to navigate my way to find his mother. But finally, I found him, and we have one big family. And thank you for my mom for accepting me to manage your, your, your son. Thank you very much. Let me thank also the legends who are here. Can I just finish so you can just clap at the end? Otherwise, it might be a bit longer. Let me also thank the legends who are here, and I'll tell you a story about... Cabo Zondo and the rest. Uh, let me thank Brashakes for being here, Dr. Kumalo, who finally got it and decided to join uh, the moving train. <laughs> he didn't get it for a long time, finally got it. <laughs> let me thank Brajay, who's been very supportive. I must tell you something that, because of what I've, 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 I've seen about Brajay, and when I tell a story about how I got inspired to be a professional footballer and eventually become a player manager when I was about 12, Brajay was buying Highlands Park from Dion Highlands Park. And I saw Brajay in a kumbi from a distance. You know, when you're little children, you all want to see the superstar. And we're just pushing ourselves just to see him, just to see him, not to touch him. And from that moment on, I fought my way to be a footballer and eventually become a manager. Brajay, I want to thank you. And you know, I told you this. And, and today, I think Brajay is one of those people that every year, when I have a year and function with the players, he comes and gives them a motivation. Thank you for that, Brajay. Let me thank also Cabo Zondo. When I saw Teko for the first time at uh, Bitver Stadium, he was playing for the playoffs again at uh, City Pillars. And there was this player, number 10. I'm sure you'll see him. He was different from everyone. He didn't comb his hair at the time. It looked very rough. I wasn't so sure whether he was on drugs or anything. But I just liked the fact that he was busy on the pitch. And so when after the game, we asked somebody to say, we won jersey number 10. And I said to Cabo, stay on the side where they exit. I'll go the other side so he can't get out. So Cabo went to the main gate. I went to the other gate. You know, Pit Vest is very dodgy. You might go anywhere and get out. So we, we blocked all the corners. So Teko waited at the parking lot. He'd hide under the car. When everybody was gone, he realized that he can't get out anymore. He had to come to us. So that's how the, the story began and eventually became a player. And thank you, Teko, for accepting to sign with us. I think as, as a, uh, a matter of principle, I must thank the media. Um, Tiko speaks about what he has gone through, but I think a lot of stuff that the media did for Tiko was more of building him. He became very quiet and he got stuck in his house, even if his, was, his house became a night, nightclub, but that's where I wanted him to be, let him be caged in there. Because the media report versus 
what could be seen physically could have been a disaster. So for that, I think I want to thank all the media who contributed to Tiko's career to date. And for that, we'll forever be grateful. I think he, he realizes now and he knows that he's also on his way to planning his exit to give the little Tiko Mrisa. I don't know if you saw the little Tiko Mrisa that he inspired an opportunity to be the Tiko Mrisa one day. So for that, let me thank you as well. Let me also thank the, I know that some of the legends that I worked with uh, I saw, I thought, I'm sure some of the players that I worked with before, before the, the, the crop of Tikomuri and them. And I must also thank my colleagues in, in, in the space that we're in. I know the media is saying we have been sued by competition commission. That's not true. Glenn Binkin is here, and I think Arthur Lamin is also here. We, we're part of that crew that, that they say we have been sued. So I must thank you also, gentlemen, for supporting uh, the legend because we are one big family as, as we are. Let me also thank um, my family. I saw my brother Lucas is here. I saw uh, Isaac Shabalala. Shabas' father is here. And that's how we roll. And I think that for that, I must also thank him and, and his family for, for allowing me. And I'm going to invite all the players that are here from professionals. I know Shaba is here. So I don't know who's here. So can I ask those boys that uh, or Mark Williams think that he's also, he's also my player, but it's fine. I'll, I'll call Mark Williams. Mark Williams wishes he was young, so he can be my player, but I'll also call him. Can I call those players? Shaba, can you please, and, and, and she should call those who are here, because I don't know who's here, so I can, you can get a proper acknowledgement for being part of this moving train. On the same note, let me also thank, I'll come to Nicholas, and I'll tell you the story about Nicholas. Let me thank Robert. Um, please come forward, gentlemen. Give them a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. And by the way, they're not easy to manage. Don't think that it's actually, it actually looks as easy as they walk here. <laughs> Let me also thank Robert Marawa. I'll tell you a story. Um, for me, I think I, talent for me, it's, it's in a different format. I've always known Robert's prowess in the media space. And I've always known and understood what he, what he stood for. And also like him, it took him a long time to understand where my train is going and eventually agreed to be my in-house MC. And thank you very much, Robert, for being my in-house MC. And now because he understands what we're trying to achieve. Thank you very much. Nicholas, I can't pronounce your surname. Kikernes, what are you? You can call me what you like, Jeff. <laughs> Nicholas' first call was messed up by Sokala Duma. So when he made that call and he said, I'm Sokala Duma, everything went wrong. So then, and I said, Nicholas, I'm busy. I think he, he thought that I'm a difficult person. He called me the following day. Oh, by the way, Mark Williams also is here. Mark Williams is also part of the legend that are supporting these players that you see in front of me. I'll come to them. So Nick called me, as you know, then he said um, he feels that he's, he's, he's the right man to write the book. Teko and I had already met about four authors who wanted to write his book. I think what I liked about Nick is that when he spoke to me, he didn't come across as Teko's fan. My problem was I hated hangers and fans who are going to write about Teko because I know what can happen. A lot of things could go wrong. So Nico, Nick came across as a professional author who, when I eventually agreed that he can have access to Teko and start talking to Teko, the, I think the rest is history. Everybody else can read about it. And I want to thank him. I know I was difficult for you, Nick at the start, but I think you understood why I was difficult, and I think ultimately good things come to those who wait, and thank you for writing such a brilliant piece of a book. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, and whilst I'm, I'm, I've thanked everyone else, please, for those that did not mention by the names, I know my sister is here, she'll kill me, she thinks that she's my PR, Paladi, she claims that she's my PR, so let me also acknowledge Tambazwani, Happy Jele, and Kosi, Mabukwani, Spio Shabalala for supporting Teko. This is the train that I'm talking about. So this guy is part of what one is trying to achieve is to keep them as a family, but not only that, to support each other, to understand that one day they're going to be next door neighbors to an ordinary man who's not a celebrity. So it, it, part of it is to become a good neighbor so that they don't become these big celebrities who cannot greet their own neighbor. So because one day they won't be playing football. 
It will just be an ordinary man who a neighbor would ask if he can drop his child at school because he's rushing for a meeting. And I want them to understand that that's the reality. That's how life works. At the moment, they fly for free. They stay in the hotels for free. They probably eat for free. So they don't understand that at some point, these things you buy them. You buy a ticket for flight. You book for a hotel. You pay for it. You buy for food. You buy food to eat. So all those elements, I must tell you that we are not there, but I think gradually they're getting it. And I think one day I can, when I retire, I'll say I've contributed towards a society because it's not about me here. It's about the society. If these guys are becoming good neighbors, good fathers, we'll have a great nation. And on that note, let me thank everyone who's here. And God bless you. And please buy the book. These guys will sign it and everything else you'll hear and read in the book. If I've omitted you, if I've omitted you, please, it's not because I want to. Uh, my colleague here is pushing me to, to move. I thank you and I thank you from the bottom of my heart and thank you very much for all business associates as well who are here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Like, like I said, thank you so much to Jasmine. If you all can just remain seated and that's just to make sure that the process runs quite smoothly uh, with the book signing uh, with Dicker as well. Uh, Mark Williams, uh, if you can come forward as well. I think there'll be a photo opportunity with the legends. Uh, as well as the author and Tico. And let me give everybody a chance. Let me thank Rosebank Ball. Let me thank Exclusive Books for allowing us to be here. Thanks so much. Give yourselves a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen.